Well, good evening, everyone. We're in 1 Peter chapter 2. And uh, we've got a couple of readers, I think. Let me just look at where we're at right now. We're just going to kind of breeze through the first three verses. We covered some of them last week. Second, 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 through 3. Verse 1, therefore put inside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. We talked about, asked the question, is that a good place for a chapter break? And anytime you see a chapter start with, therefore, it's not a good place for a chapter break because it's concluding what was said before. And the one point I didn't make last week is, why is that important? If you're not into grammar, who cares, right? But it's extremely important. Because being trained in school, most people, when they read a subject, they read in chapter chunks, just like Andrew. He didn't say read three and two-thirds chapters. He tells us three chapters. I read always whole chapters, if I'm not mistaken. And so I saw a church that had a major problem. And we were, but we were working out in a, in a godly way, but we were very divided over something. And the reason it took us so long to find the answer, because people stopped reading the Bible at the end of a chapter, and it looked like, it looked like the topic changed. And being a new student in Bible skills, I finally discovered that, shared it with all the people in the meeting, 18 or 19, they said, hey, well, let's go home. That does it. It's huge understanding um, about chapter breaks. And if you say to someone, and I, I know I'm making a, a point of this, a long one, but you, you look at the Good Samaritan, and I don't know if I preached it, I know I taught it in Bible school, but I ask, who needed to hear the message, right? The lawyer goes up to Jesus, um, you know, and he says, what do, what do you need to do to be saved? And, and love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. Who's my neighbor? He says, wishing to justify himself. Luke 10, around verse 25. Jesus tells him about the Good Samaritan. Now remember, he's talking to Jews. Jews hated Samaritans. And he's making the Samaritan, and it doesn't say it's a parable. It may actually have happened. But the, para, the Samaritan is a good guy. So I ask in Bible skills, in case you ever take my class, you get, you get an extra point for this. Of all the people listening to the parable, uh, not the story, not the parable, it doesn't say parable, of all the people listening to um, the issue about the Good Samaritan, who needed the message the most? Who needed to hear it most? Who needed to understand it most? And most people say, well, the lawyer, scribe, whatever he's called. Not at all. Just a few chapters before, chap few verses before chapter 10 begins. Jesus and his 12 apostles are walking through Samaria. He sends the apostles on to make arrangements. That means to buy food, maybe some lodging. We're not told. The Samaritans wouldn't help him, wouldn't, wouldn't even sell them anything. So they came back, and what did James and John say? What did James and John say? Don. Um, who's the mic man? Okay, he's close. Don, what did James and John ask? They, they asked Jesus if, the, if they should call down fire from heaven and destroy them like, like Elijah did to those 153 men from, or, or the 100 and, 102 men. of. The so there was some racial or religious prejudice going on here. And so James and John thought the best thing to do was kill them. Their prejudice. Let's just, should we just call down fire from heaven and kill them? And these 12 men, 11 of them, we're going to turn the world upside down with the good news and the love of God, not far off, not even a year away. They were going to turn it upside down, and they didn't know who the neighbor was. They were willing to kill people that were nice to them. I've never met a Christian. I'm sure there are many, but I've never met a Christian who knew that in my Bible school, 30 Bible schools classes. So I know I'm hammering the point because I am. But it's really important to know when a chapter starts and begins, not because you like grammar, because you may need it to save a soul. You may need it to understand God more correctly. So big deal in my, in my limited opinion. <laughs> All right. We talked about the five nasties right there are a test. 
Just before that, it says, you know, we're to, we're to be purify ourselves um, in obedience for a sincere love of the brethren. And, and then it says, put these things away because they test our purity. If these still linger in us, then we haven't purified ourselves yet. And they're battles. They can be battles. All right. Didn't discuss this. Like newborn babes, babies, like newborn babies, long for the... Stop one more time. So, Andrew, you made the point about the enduring word of God. I said, you know, we're born again, and because based upon the word of God, that's it. it lasts forever if we are born again. You made the point about the word of God, and before that and after that, Peter really emphasizes the importance of the word of God. Here's one of those right here. Like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word so that by you may grow in respect to salvation. So, need a volunteer. So, tell me, what's the significance of newborn babies longing for milk? What, what point is Peter trying to make about that? So, we'll take Bill Spawn. What point is he trying to make about longing for it like newborn babies? <laughs> Yeah, what baby do you know that doesn't long for milk? I mean, it's not just a preference, right? It's like, this is all I really want. And so that just that tremendous, you know, need and passion for something. That's Amen. the way we should be toward, uh, you know, the milk of the word. Amen. Amen. And Michael Franklin. I'm, I've not seen a baby yet that goes, pardon me. Might I get some milk, please? You know, no. They have a certain pitch that they reach that every woman within a mile hears, and most men, but especially women. They, they have a certain, and you can tell a newborn from, you know, one that's a little bit older. They, they just have that certain nasally that, that gets their attention. And, and so, in, in a way, what Peter's saying is, don't be satisfied and let, until you're fed. Amen. You demand it like a newborn baby. A newborn baby is not polite about it, but you, spiritually, you, you, be in, you be the kind of person that says, no, I really have to know. Amen. Amen. Dan, do you want to add to that? Okay. Uh, so it's, it's the idea is, thank you, craving. I mean, I have to have it. And what happens if they don't have it? They die. We, we don't. We can, we can go oat milk instead or, or apple juice or, or salad or steak. Their lives depend upon it, just like ours depend upon the Word of God. Totally dependent upon it. Man shall not live by bread alone, another metaphor, you know, food issue. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's interesting, too, that I can't tell you how many times I've heard this, you know, passage taught. And what is focused on is, well, there's the milk of the word. And then there's the meat. That's not what he's talking about. No, here. that's not what he's talking about. And, and, and so, you know, I mean, he uses that expression, but it's not talking about, you know, someone who just is, is living on milk. This can be an individual who is old in the faith. You still need to be like a newborn baby who demands milk, not milk spiritually, but milk, um, not milk physically, but milk spiritually in the sense that which will sustain your soul. Absolutely. When people wrote this letter, there had been, some of these people have been Christians for probably at least 30 years. It's before 70, 80, but 30 years. And he's talking to all of them. And, and Harold, you can nod or talk or whatever, but, but so when you read your Bible systematically, when you, the, the good times and, and you're able to do that, does that affect you at all? Rather than the days where maybe you go a few weeks without reading the Bible? Any, any differences? Yeah, it does. Uh, it's, it's like uh, satisfying a thirst. Yeah, yeah. It, it's amazing. Uh, it, it, I don't know of a Christian that it doesn't affect long time or not. 
Oh, man, I forgot all about that. I sure need to work on that. Or, oh, that's the answer that I needed. Or, or I'm working on a sermon and I'm trying to, trying to read, um, you know, a little bit every week. And go, ooh. But it affects our, our everyday life. Everyday life. And, and the result of it, if a baby gets the milk, they grow. They don't, they don't grow. And the same is true with Christians. You could say you get a little bit of, of the milk of the word when we meet in our songs and hopefully our classes and sermons. But, you know, longing for it means, wow, I'm really swamped. I'm really busy, but I'm going to make room. I'm hungry. I crave it. I'm going to make a point to get more of God's word, the milk. I mean, Dan and let's see, Gary, this is Dan right here. In the, yeah, right there, yeah. Just a second, because we want to record you. Here we go. In line of that thought, somebody's made a play on the word fanatic, and I believe what we're talking about is being a fanatic, and Ah. that is being a fan of something and being literally addicted to it. Ah. I think that's the kind of passion where we need to be fanatics about the word. Wow. Wow. We won't be disappointed. It's going to say that a little later on. And Don, Gary Don has his hand up as well on your left there. Are you going to get it? You, you, you know what the uh, writer of Hebrews says about, about, about milk, right? I do. Hebrews okay. 5, 12 yeah, to yeah, 14. Yeah, yeah and, that, and that's from a... Be- I'm not very, going to use this, so go ahead. That's a, from a very, very different perspective. Amen. About, about being mature, not you know, gr- growing in the faith and not needing the milk over and over and over again, but, but move on to, you know, other... Right. I, I, I just wondered if you were going to... Because, because No, when, I wasn't, when, because um, cause I think, Mike... So, great question, because here we have people, long-time Christians, some of them, that didn't have a, a good handle on the word, and this one, I think, is fair to say... Crave the nourishment of the word. It's not just a baby, but crave the nourishment that we need from the word of God. Andrew? Were you going to say anything about the the fact that it's pure milk? You know, I studied it. And, and I have some thoughts on it, and I didn't put them in my notes. So um, if, if you have a thought, go ahead. If not, I'll say something. It's like the f- baby formula recall that happened because it had impurities in it. It wasn't going to make those babies grow because it wasn't pure. It would have been bad for them. And it's the same thing here. That I, I, He could have just said, long for the milk of the word, but he didn't. He said, long for the pure milk of the word. Amen. There, there is milk that is not pure. Um, and uh, that, that would be doctrines and, and stuff that are false, Beautiful. right? You're, you're to long for, the, word, uh, for the, the pure milk of the word, not some man's opinion or whatever. You want the stuff that comes from God. So there's no flaw, and, and this is, you're right on, I wasn't going to say, but there's no flaw in it. It's pure. There's no defect. There's nothing that when we read it leads us astray. It's pure. It's Unad- perfect. Unadulterated. Unadulterated. Good, good word. Was there another hand? I thought I saw movement. But, um, okay. So, excellent, excellent thoughts um, that you may grow in and, and grow in respect to salvation regardless of where you are on your journey. And, and we have a lot of mature Christians, godly, God-loving Christians in this room, but every one of us will admit, along with what the Bible says, that, that we have room to grow. So I think that's the thought right here. All right? Verse, ah, last week, our first class I said, think about what so that means. Last week I asked, what does the phrase, it's one word in the Greek, what does the word phrase so that mean? And it means it's, it's stating the purpose of the things said before or after, but it's, it has to do with purpose or consequences. So it's used nine times in this short little book. Here's one example. Long for the pure work of the uh, milk of the word, so that by it, what's the result? Growth in the and respect to salvation. Now, again, this may be one you go, I don't care. Well, probably today, if probably not today, but by next week, we're going to hit a really big one. This phrase 
is overlooked, as I mentioned last time, and sometimes so is the consequences of the purpose. And there's one in this chapter that is gigantic and missed by many, many Christians. So I just want you to notice that when we see it, I'm going to try to point it out. All right. So, uh, Michael. <laughs> so, would you uh, expound on you may grow in respect to salvation? Aren't you either saved or not saved? So, yeah, that, that's good. So, right on. Another thing I looked into, and this is so meaty. I say, I'm not going to talk about that unless I'm going to raise it. So, number one, he's not writing to the lost. Crave the pure milk of the word so you can be saved. He's not saying that. He's saying to Christians, this is who this is written to. You can read about it in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. He's writing to Christians, those who have been scattered about, living as aliens, how they can grow in respect to salvation. They're, they're already saved, and that's a good point. Not telling you how to be saved, but that we, each one of us, needs to be growing in that area. Go ahead. So, you know, um, if, we, if, we, if we equated salvation with spiritual wealth, we, we as individuals, most of us are not satisfied with the wealth that we have, are we? Still, are we not wealthy? We are. But wouldn't you like to grow with respect to your wealth? To, to gain more, I mean, in a, in, yeah. a, in a right way. So here, we, none of us have, have plumbed the depth of God's blessings in salvation. <laughs> I mean, we, we've not even dog paddled on the surface yet. So we can, we can plunge much more deeply into that grace and that, uh, that you know, blessing that he has promised us and, and learn to appreciate it more and to express it more to others. If we're growing along that line, if we are growing, if we've grown since, since two years ago, number one, we're getting more out of life. We're, we should be enjoying it more. Trusting God more and more, peace. And we should, uh, our interpersonal relationships have probably improved as we're growing because the whole Bible, really, in, in a nutshell, in my words, is it's about conflict resolution, resolving conflict with God, resolving conflict with other people. But we're growing in, in all these positive ways. Yes, I know that with wisdom comes grief, it's, it's true, but, but the, the positiveness of, of growing is even uh, more weighty. And he's almost to you, Dan. Just a thought in that regard. If, you, if we consider the two verses, verse 1 and verse 2, verse 1 represents malnutrition. That will result in death. Yes, it will. That will result in spiritual death and separation from God. Verse 2 is good nutrition, pure nutrition, yeah. which will result in salvation. So I think if you just look at those two verses together, this grow in respect to salvation makes, makes a lot of sense. It does. Thank you so much. Verse 3. If you've tasted the kindness of the Lord, ah, still playing on the same thing. Long for the pure milk of the word. And if you, by the way, if you've tasted the kindness of the Lord, see, there's this, this um, consuming idea still. If you've tasted it, so you kind of keep to that theme. Uh, if I think he says, if, I think he says these things are if you've tasted the kindness of the Lord. Because the result of the growth, and if you've tasted the kindness of the Lord, we're going to abhor and eliminate the first five things from our lives the best we can. The slander, the malice, the deceit, the envy, and the hypocrisy. If we taste the, the truth of God, the ways of God are so delicious that if we've tasted those enough, the junk food that the world offers us is not appealing. There's a time when you go, I, I don't want any more of those candy bars. Well, I'm not to that point yet, but <laughs> no, it, we taste, there's no comparison. We taste the kindness of the Lord, go, 
I missed drinking for about two years because I was a heavy drinker, right? Uh, I missed it. But there came a time when I despised it. I, even though I know it wasn't good for me, I would see it and go, that stuff right there ruins lives. Amen. And I've seen it ruin people's lives in my own family. So, so the point is, we taste the kindness of the Lord. It is delicious. We won't want the stuff from the world as much. It's still a battle, but we won't want it nearly to the same degree. We will, if we taste the kind of Lord, we will get rid of the poison up there. Let's move on to, um, we're going to have a reading now, and uh, Gary, it'll be uh, Jonathan first. We're going to read 1 Peter chapter 2, 4 through 8. But watch this, what he's reading, if you read along with him, watch for the metaphor, the repeating metaphor of stones and rock. It's, he's going to use it a whole bunch of times in the next five verses. If you would, please, Jonathan. <clears throat> and coming to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders reject. This became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. And to this doom, they were also appointed. Thank you so much, Jonathan. How many of you either collect rocks and stones now or did maybe when you were young as a child? Anybody ever collect rocks and, and stones and agates and all this kind of thing? So, uh, um, Dan, it, it, we won't wait for the mic necessarily, but did you ever find one that was alive? Oh, a ro- oh it's moving. It, no, you never found one that's alive. To him, this is Jesus is the living stone, unheard of. Does it exist in the physical realm? But in the spiritual realm, it's very much so. Jesus is the living stone. And I'm going to skip over some stuff we'll come back to. But I want to just connect it. I want to connect Jesus as, uh, as to a living stone, uh, who is a living stone. Now, I did get this going earlier today. I guess it's gone off. Jesus is the living stone, and it says, you also, you Christians, are living stones as well. So tell me, we may not wait for the mic, just yell it out, but what's something you can do with stones? I know David killed Goliath, so don't say that one. What's something else you can do with stones? Build Build stuff. (laughs) Oh, right. That is exactly the idea here. Being built up, you also, as a living stone, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices <laughs> acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I'm going to stay on the stones a minute. We'll get to those other things. But God built his house first on Jesus. We read, you read, Jonathan, that he's the chief cornerstone. But just picture us as as part of the building block, and we'll even cover it some more because there's some overlap in these verses, but just picture each of us in a spiritual sense. We are part of the temple of God, the dwelling place of God, it says so in 1 1 Corinthians 3, 16, uh, 6, 19, Ephesians 2, which we'll look at. We are building blocks, living stones, in the temple of God. So, I'm not hammering on attendance, but I want to make a point. Because I know when I was a young Christian, a lot of people equated attendance, attending every assembly, with faithfulness. And I'm not saying there's not a connection there sometimes. That's not where I'm coming from. I'm just saying this, that we are part of God's temple we're to interact together, we're to assemble on the first day of the week. There's a lot of important things that happen when we do. So imagine as if five 
of our members, of our living stones, chose, not for the sickness, but just chose not to be here. Imagine that making five holes in our walls, letting light and insects in, and the wind and the cold or the hot. We would notice the holes because five of the living stones were gone. And we do notice those. I, I don't know of any sincere Christian that's ambivalent towards that. I, I hurt when I know people chose not to be with other Christians because we're so important. We are we're members of the temple of God, and we have a major purpose, which I won't talk about tonight. You can if you think we should. But huge living stones, and when one chooses not to be here, it makes a difference, much less five or more. Michael. When it says that Jesus is a living stone, and you, we talked about building with stone, one of the things you can do with stone that is better than any other substance you could use is to lay a foundation. And I've never lived in a house nor seen a house where the foundation laid itself. And you're right. And so before you go on, we're going to look at that very concept, just so you know. We're going okay. to look at foundation. We're going to look at apostles and prophets, Ephesians 2. We're going to look at Jesus as the, I mean, right where you're going, and you're right on because you're a Bible student. You crave it. So that's good stuff, but I'm just going to hold you okay. off for a second because we're going to, we are absolutely going to, going to get to that. But let's take a look at that very point in Ephesians chapter 2, 19 through 21. Let's, let's go there now, and I'll put it up on the board. I do have it here, if you'd like to read off of this New American Standard. So, Michael, would you read for us Ephesians 2, 19 through 21? I think sure. it's through, no, through 22. Okay. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. This is a parallel passage to what we just Isn't read. it parallel? Amazingly parallel. So we have living stones. We have, here are some of the living stones. There's a foundation that Michael mentioned earlier. And the foundation, foundation, they're made out of something solid, concrete, back in then, these, these days, stones. But the foundation was apostles and prophets. And the Christ Jesus was part of the foundation, but the most important part, the chief cornerstone, you may know about it already, but it needs to be said that chief cornerstone was the first big stone Part of the foundation laid down because everything was squared off of it. The height was, was based off the, the uh, cornerstone, the, 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 the lines off the cornerstone. Everything, everything depended upon the cornerstone being laid properly or they're going to have a mess, maybe a failure even. So we have living stones. Jesus is the first. We have the apostles and prophets, but he's not the only one because it says, it talks about, and whom the whole building, that's the church, the kingdom, the temple of God, being fitted together. There's the idea of building again. They're fitted together as stones and foundations are, growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also, now speaking to all Christians, and you, you also are being built together into a dwelling place. And to, and to a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So great self, Michael. And, and just pretty big. For me, when I read words like these, if I'm not going to teach them, sometimes I, some things don't mean a lot to me. I, although I was in construction, I was a subcontractor. I wasn't involved uh, as much as you were, Bill. So I might, I might kind of, I get it and, and breeze over it, but huge because every one of us is a part of the church. And, and by the way, I'll refer to 1 Timothy 3.15. We are the church, the pillar, the pillar and support of the truth. We have a major function. Brother? We are the true temple. <clears throat> and 
that temple in the Old Testament was just a type. I mean, it was an amazing temple, but it was just a type. It was just a, a, a kind of, I mean, it's a temple that God dwelt in, but God can't dwell in, you know, temples made by hands. And this temple he's able to dwell in in a better way. Yeah. Because each of us is part of the stones. And if we have the spirit in us, which I don't think is a miraculous thing, it's that we are trying to be like Jesus and have his same heart, then we are serving like Jesus served. So this is the real temple. This is the real this temple. is the thing God yeah. way back then when that temple was built, it was just pointing to this temple, which is you and me. Amen. All of us. We're, so we're spiritual building blocks, not, not physical in any way, but much more important. And Don, spiritual building blocks. While you're, he's getting to Don, I'll just say that we're not going to read these, but 1 Corinthians 3.16, 1 Corinthians 6.19, speaking to Christians, says that we are the temple of God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He dwells in us. What an awesome privilege and responsibility. Don? Yeah, I was thinking of another reference you could you could use for that from the book of Psalms, of course. Psalm 118, around verse 22 or so. That's the, right. the, 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 building, the, the, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And what I was going to say about that temple is that temple was built of stone, but lifeless. Lifeless, lifeless stone. Lifeless. Amen. And now, the temp, and now we are the temple of God, living, living temple. So it, it, it's like, it's like that, that's what Jesus did. He, 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 he um, turned lifeless into life. It, it's like when he turned the water into wine. What, what does wine have that water does not have? Carbon, which is the element of life, right? Mm. So, so when Jesus turned the water into the wine, I think I've talked about this before, that, that, that he, he was actually creating life out of death, right? Nice. That's, that's wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, we've got a few more scriptures. Maybe we'll get through a couple of these verses coming up. Um, okay, verse 5. You also, as living stones, repeating, repeating the idea, are being built up as a spiritual house, repeating the idea, for a holy priesthood. We're going to get to that a little bit more in, in chapter, in verse 9, but a holy priesthood. I'll just say this. That, no, I won't, no, no. Holy, I'll just say this, that, that holy, as we talked about on Sunday, means set apart for something special. It's not just average dinnerware that you, you set, but it's your best. It's set apart, it's distinguished, it's, it's an honorable thing. We're, we're a very special priesthood. Very much different than priesthoods comprised of just select people. We're a holy priesthood in the sight of God. Why? To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. Now, this is kind of a... I want to talk about spiritual sacrifices. So, in Hebrews 13, 15, it says, Through him then, let us con through Jesus, let us continually offer up sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of the lips to give thanks to his name. Did you know that was a sacrifice? I, you probably did because we've talked about it, I believe. But, but praising God, singing to God, praying to God, proclaiming God, those are sacrifices. You're choosing to do that out of your heart. And he sees that as a sweet-smelling sacrifice. And then 16, and do not neglect doing good and sharing. For with such sacrifices... God is pleased. So doing good, as Andrew pointed out tonight, that, that that's why we were designed by God, is to do good. Um, those are also forms of sacrifice that are very acceptable uh, to our God. And let, anything else? On, any, we good on that? Okay, let's go to 1 Peter 2, 6. For well, this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. That's Jesus, if you know your Scriptures. And he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Peter is quoting out of Isaiah 28, 16, right here. This precious value, then, 
is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, the main stone, the most important stone in the entire building, as we said earlier, was the cornerstone. They laid it first, everything else squared off with it. So some rejected it. There were some who believe. It's precious value for those who believe, verse 7. Some rejected it, those who disbelieve. And the choice stone, choice means a preference. That's, that's my choice. I, I want, I choose this one. Choice in the sight of God, hopefully. Choice in the sight of people as well. Precious, high value, the highest value possible in this case. We talked about the cornerstone dropping down to the end of verse 7. So in verse 7, some chose well. Some believed and they, they chose well. But look at verse 8. And a stone of stumbling, this cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. And to this doom, they were also appointed. So it says, appointed to doom. Who made the decision to, for the, with the consequences of them being doomed? Where did that decision come from? Michael? It came from those who rejected the cornerstone. It, 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 it would be like a group of supposed you know, stonemasons out there working on, on a structure. <clears throat> and they, they find that they can't you know, find a cornerstone, and yet in the rubble that they're working, there's, there's the perfect stone. There's yeah, the one perfect that's... Perfect stone. And, and, and they're so um, deficient in their trade that they can't recognize it. And, 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 and the point being that God gave them everything they needed to know yeah. to recognize this stone. Yeah. But yeah. like it says, they were disobedient in the word, so they didn't recognize it. And what they strove to produce was utterly defective and not a glory it to God It was effective. They rejected the Christ as being exactly. unacceptable. Exactly. But they, they chose wrong. Now, here's one. You know, there's, there's a lot of division over who does the deciding, who is appointed. And in Ephesians chapter 1, 4 and following, there's a lot of division over um, what it means by those that are chosen as, as, um, as sons of God. The word he uses there, I'm drawing a blank, Predestined. Those predestined. He uses it in Romans as well. But, but there's a lot of argument. Predestined means they had no choice. And, and, and I know that you don't believe that, but we need to know how to answer that objection because there are many, many who claim to be Christians, I mean in the millions, that believe you have a person has no choice in their salvation, which really strikes to the heart of God. But is they would use this verse as one of their proof texts. Uh, some were appointed to doom. What does that mean then? Can anyone explain how they were appointed if God didn't predetermine? Andrew, please. Well, I was going to bring up Ephesians 1 and say that in the same way that Ephesians 1, that we're appointed uh, as children of God or predestined to be children of God, these, these were appointed to doom. Um, God, God said this is what's going to happen if they if they reject the cornerstone, they will be, uh, they will be doomed. And uh, just like we get to choose whether or not we want to be children of God, they got to choose whether or not they would be doomed uh, by their actions. It's the same concept. Um, God, um, we are predestined to be children of God in the way that that's how we're going to be saved, right? It says that we're predestined to salvation, uh, and, and that's by being in Christ, yeah. Um, he didn't predestine us to be in Christ. He said those who will be saved will be in Christ. Here, it's those who reject the cornerstone will be doomed. Amen. And they get to choose. Amen. And so, uh, Bill Spawn, please. 
and then Michael Franklin. Their, their appointment to doom is based upon the fact that they are disobedient to the word. Yeah. Not that God made them in such a way they only had one choice and that was to be disobedient to the word. <clears throat> totally it's their responsibility. So the appointment is based upon their choice, as Andrew was saying. They decided to be disobedient, which those who decide that, that's their appointment. Amen. I'm, I, amen. So, pre so in Ephesians 1, <clears throat> chapter 5, 1, verse 5, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intent of the will. So those who, chose, who choose Jesus... They're predestined. You choose Jesus as Savior, you're on your way. That's what God is asking for. You reject Jesus, you're going in a different direction, but it's a point predetermined ahead of time, just like um, what, I don't listen to the radio anymore, but um, when I was younger, I listened to a lot of, of radio, and the disc jockey or whoever it was, the, the speaker would go, okay, uh, we're going to have a contest now. Uh, so caller number nine, whoever caller number nine is, the, you ruin the prize. You get, to, you get to answer the question. It was predetermined. But nobody knew who caller number nine was going to be. But it was determined before they probably did the radio program. They have to outline these things. We'll make it caller number nine. Whoever that is, he gets to talk. He gets to win. Whatever it is predetermined not knowing who it would be. And same with, same with our salvation. If Dan chooses Jesus, you've already been predetermined to be saved because that's God's way to bring man home, sinful man home, and, and predetermined. Michael, and then we'll end. Okay. Um, I like John, uh, Luke 7, 29 and 30, which says, regarding the baptism of John, when all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. So powerful. So powerful. Thank you very much. Appreciated all your participation. We'll pick up with um, probably verse 9 next week. God bless you. Hopefully we'll see each other on Sunday.